so uh, buenas tardes, uh, good evening. We are here with uh, Virginia Virginia Eubanks, who is uh, one of the leading uh, uh, scholars on uh, the, uh, the effect that algorithm has, has on the, the public administration. Uh, she is the author of this book, uh, La Automatización de la Desigualdad, that has been recently uh, in English <laughs> fine recently translated uh, by uh, Capitan Swing. Uh, he's going very well, no? Uh, the second edition now. And, well, I didn't know, that's really exciting. Yeah. Thank you for second edition, so uh, congratulations, congratulations, Virginia. She's also uh, well, a professor, an associate professor in the Department of Political Science on the, at, the, at the University of Albany in Sunny. And we will start talking a bit about uh, her Maravellous book and her marvelous research that has uh, well, she spent like ten years for this book, if I don't, if I know it correctly. Roughly, yeah, seven, maybe seven or eight. I'd have to go back and uh, do that. There's, there are a lot of personal histories uh, around this book, as you can, as you can see if you read it. See, the book is focused on uh, what has been published like uh, three years ago in in, in English. Uh, there's a lot of uh, examples focused on Los, on Los Angeles and Indianapolis. So in Indiana, sorry, basically, but uh, most of the dynamics that she she describes are quite uh, related, or we can understand better our dynamics with with those examples. So I don't want to spend more time on this, Virginia. So I'm going to start uh, doing some questions. Uh, well. Uh, what's this uh, kind of, can you briefly uh, define what's this digital asylum that you are describing? Well, buenos dias and um, welcome to my kitchen. Um, I'm, I'm just really excited to be here um, to talk about the book and I'm thrilled to, to hear it's in a, the book's in a second edition um, and really excited to learn more from people who are, um, people like you, people who are doing this work in, in Spain about um, exactly this question you raise of how these global patterns emerge, um, even though these systems roll out in di very different ways in different places. So I'm really excited for this conversation. Thanks for having me. Um, so the upshot of the book, the sort of um, easy description is that I describe um, the attempt in the United States to build what I call a digital poorhouse which is um, an invisible institution for um, incarcerating, containing, um, demobilizing, and sort of um, doing moral calculus um, on poor and working class people in the United States to decide who deserves help and who does not through our social assistance system. And that's something I know I need to explain in a Spanish context. So we can talk about that more in a minute, this idea that we don't have an um, economic, economic human rights framework around social assistance. We have sort of a moral framework that um, tends to um, do moral diagnosis first. So like, are you worthy? Are you deserving of help? Um, in a way that doesn't happen in, in, in other places. And part of my argument is that if you look back at the history of poverty management in the United States, that it shouldn't surprise you that these tools act to um, basically diagnose, um, to diagnose sort of dysfunction, to um, police poor and working class families, um, to demobilize their, their political work, um, their collective political work, um, and that the impacts of this on um, families uh, who are most directly affected by these systems um, can be really catastrophic. And so I tell three stories um, in the book. I tell a story about an automated eligibility system that's supposed to decide who is eligible for um, cash assistance and for medical assistance in the state of Indiana. Um, I describe a system um, that advocates call the dot, uh, the um, the match.com of homeless services in Los Angeles that's supposed to match the most um, vulnerable unhoused people with the most appropriate available resource. And I describe a predictive model in Allegheny County, which is in Pennsylvania, it's the county where Pittsburgh is, that's supposed to be able to guess which children might be victims of abuse or neglect in the future. And then I, I, I sort of open it up to talk a little bit about what this means about how we understand poverty, what this means about how we understand technology. 
this is very very interesting for for me because what you you, you describe a system uh, well we have a kind of a welfare state here so uh, maybe the comparisons are a bit strange for for the people here but uh, I think that some of the underlying logics are the same and is this uh, punishment of the poor and one of the one of the the continuous uh, mentions in your book were related to, to the time of Ronald Reagan. Uh, so I would like to know, because this is the same in the United States and in Spain, how neoliberalism and how those uh, privatization logics associated to the state as a punishment board, not quite the contrary, that should assist the people. So this criminalization of social assistant, I think this is the same. So uh, can you relate a bit those logics of neoliberalism and those other logics associated to the development of algorithms? Yeah, so what's one of the things that was really interesting for me about the book is um, that I wanted to start with the history of these social programs, because I think often when we talk about technology, we talk about them like, um, yeah, the, the Venus arriving on the half shell from the sea, right? Like it just appears and nobody knows where it comes from. And then it disrupts everything. And like, you know, and it's naturally um, sort of geared towards democracy. And we have all these stories we tell ourselves about technological change. Um, and those stories tend to lead us to believe that these tools are sort of shorn of any context um, and that they're not influenced by the systems that came before. And that I know is just clearly untrue. Um, and so I wanted to do some work on um, where the sort of internal logics of these systems came from. And I live very close to the state archives of New York State. And so I was like, OK, I'm going to look at this particular system. It's called the Welfare Management System in New York. I'm going to go look for the design documents in the, um, in the archives. And originally, I thought it probably would have happened. Um, this shift to digitization in public assistance in the United States probably would have happened um around 1996 which is when we had a big policy uh, that we could call welfare reform that um part of it uh sort of require the automation of certain um processes um here but i go to the archives and i look at 1996 and nope the systems were already there so i like i go back farther in the and i'm like well maybe it happened around the 80s right combination of the availability of the tools and the rise of neoliberalism, right? I definitely grew up with Reagan, so Reagan's always on my mind. Um, and I go back to the 80s and nope, the tools are already there. And so I kept going back. And um, two stories I think are really important. One is the that I did find what I feel is the sort of origin moment of the digital welfare state. And it's actually so interesting because it doesn't happen when the law changes. It doesn't happen when the technology changes. It happens in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And in the United States, that moment is the moment that there was a, a, a massive national social movement called the welfare rights movement. Um, which was having incredible successes, sort of knocking down discriminatory policies that had kept most single women, most women of color, um, and lots of other people off public assistance. They had great success opening up the program in a, de in a much more democratic, much more uh, uh, equitable and, and less racist, um, less classist way. Um, and th particularly they had had a number of legal successes where they knocked down these rules that had kept people out of the system for decades and decades. Um, and that's actually the moment that we see these tools arise is not when the technology becomes available or the policy changes, but rather when um, people's power threaten the system. And then we see this this shift to like, oh, we need to be more efficient. We need to be more fair, right? They always talk about it being more fair because computers are making decisions instead of people. One of the things, one of the pieces of context around that that I think is really important is the moment that these tools arise is also the moment that frontline welfare workers, the people who meet the public in the offices, in the welfare offices, are actually starting to strike not for their own employment contracts, but for better treatment for the people they serve, right? So it's this moment where workers and welfare recipients are seeing each other on the same side, 
And that's immensely threatening to the system. And the this, this system responded by moving to digitization. So that actually happened in the late 60s and early 70s in the United States. Um, I do think you can understand a lot of this, uh, this transformation through sort of neoliberal logics, right? This sort of devolution of power from the federal to the local, the, um, the privatization of some of these tools. But I did choose the tools I, I looked at. Not all of them are private. In fact, the Allegheny County um, tool is really well known for being one that was produced in-house by this agency and was not um, uh, uh, outsourced to a private company. Um, you can certainly see those logics, but I think actually the logics that you see in these systems are much older than neoliberalism. So the second story about the archives is that I, after I found the sort of origin point of the welfare management system, I kept going back in the archives. And I found that, you know, honestly, though the shift was from analog to digital in the 60s and 70s, the, the metrics and the, the ways that people were being investigated and the ways that data was being collected on poor and working class families, that goes all the way back to the 1600s. Um, and, and in the United States, um, that's a it's it's based on Elizabethan poor law. This idea that there are good poor people and bad poor people, and the job of social assistance is to separate the good from the bad, um, support the good temporarily, and punish the bad for their bad decisions. And that's what's built into these systems: is that much older, atavistic, punitive policing model of social assistance. So neoliberalism matters, but just and I was surprised. <laughs> I was like, oh, look at this, like. 1620, these forms look very much the same as the forms that we see in these these digital tools today. Did, so, did you Go ahead. Did, did you notice this kind? I mean, for, because uh, for understanding technology, the economics of technology, both neoliberalism and the post-financial crisis were key uh, after the uh, financial crisis in the United States. We've seen like the development of Google, Facebook, all those all those uh, technology companies that also legitimized activities, uh, all, the, all, all of us were consumers of, uh, and consumed this technology. So did you see any kind of uh, change on these logics? Uh, maybe more punishment, maybe more tools after the crisis, uh, where they were basically the were less cash, less money for the welfare state, and you really need uh, to use technologies uh, like a replacement of uh, of the public service. So, uh. Yeah, so there's this interesting push-pull throughout the history of the, the poorhouse and the digital poorhouse. I mean, the, the actual poorhouse in the United States, these like physical institutions that were built to incarcerate poor people who asked for help, um, I mean, they arose at a similar moment of financial crisis, right? And the whole idea was they would be more efficient. There would be economies of scale, right? So there are real resonances in the in the history that are, are pretty profound and, and, and pretty long lasting. Um, but when we have these moments um, where we perceive austerity, um, and I say perceive very specifically because austerity is a creation of people, not of What's uh, that uh, yeah. not an empirical fact of the world. Like we live in an abundant world, and austerity is a is made up um, for very specific reasons. But when we perceive when political systems perceive austerity, they often move to these systems that. Um, are geared towards, uh, you know, efficiency and cost savings, and that certainly has been the logic that um, agencies and states have used to say, you know, we we have to do this. And this is one of the things I talk about in the book is um, that I'm really concerned about is the way that these systems get perceived as being sort of simple administrative upgrades. Like they're really just what we're doing already. They're just a little faster and, and, um, and they make less fewer mistakes. Um, and I talk about these systems instead as political decision making machines, right? That we're actually making collective political decisions when we choose to automate these systems in these specific ways. And one of the political decisions we keep hiding by just saying these are just administrative upgrades, they aren't consequential changes, um, is the decision to do a kind of digital triage. This idea that there's only so, much, so many resources, there's not enough for everyone. Again, not true. That's a story about the world um, that is not necessarily empirically correct. 
Um, but the, the, the story is there's not enough for everyone. And so we have to make really hard choices about who gets access to resources and who doesn't. And that part of that decision needs to be deciding who's truly deserving. Um, and that's a political choice. Um, there are many places in the world who, who say instead, like, look, um, there is a um, there is a floor below which we will allow no one to go for any reason. Like you can't make a decision that's that's bad enough that you deserve to live in a tent on the street for 10 years like Gary Boatwright. Like that's an that's a human rights approach to to um social assistance. Um, but that is not what we do and in the United States. And that's why this um, uh, this logic, I think, of this sort of neutrality and the transparency and the uh, increased fairness of these systems is so dangerous, um, is that it hides all those political decisions behind this veneer uh, of neutrality and objectivity. Yeah, and the black the black box, the, the colored black box. One of the things, uh, well, you've been dispelling a lot of needs uh, on your book, which is quite useful. One of the things that I considered quite important after reading it, it's this idea of the this is bad for all of us. No, <laughs> it's not like well, I'm not I'm not going to use Facebook, so we will be okay. But my citizen will use it, so it will enrich data that Facebook sells to the administration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we are the next to be punished, no? We are being also uh, harvested or punished by, by the system, even if we are not poor or we are in a kind of a middle class. So uh, I would like you to explain this area. Yeah. So we have the story in the United States about poverty, that it is, um, uh, that, the, that it only affects a minority of people and that those people are probably somehow dysfunctional um, or um, uh, uh, making bad choices about their life. But with this very individualistic um, explanation for poverty in the United States, we don't have a structural critique of capitalism, for example. I mean, it exists, but it's not like widely available. Um, and so one of the things that the combination of our sort of historical hatred um, uh, of the poor and deep systemic racism in the United States, one of the things that the two of those have done together is produce this really punitive social assistance system. And one of the arguments I make in the book using um, political scientist Mark Rank's really fantastic life cycle work about poverty is that this story that poverty only affects a tiny minority of people is, is just incorrect. It's empirically wrong. Um, that the 51% of Americans will be below the poverty line at some point between the ages of 20 and 64. And close to a full two thirds of us will receive like um, means tested public assistance. So it's basic welfare, um, which is the most sort of stigmatized kind of public assistance in the United States. So if that's true, and it is, um, then this idea that poverty is a minority problem is 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 crazy and then we're building these tools with a picture of who's um going to be affected by them we're building these systems that we will eventually be in our, ourselves many of us not everybody there is a huge percentage of the american population that is very insulated from these systems and may go their whole life never coming into contact with them at least until end of end of life if they end up in a nursing home um, that's not my experience. Um, I, I'm a little bit more economically precarious. I grew up middle class, but um, my partner has a disability, and so he relies on, on disability insurance. I've been on public assistance in the past. Um, as a household, we've, we've relied on a number of different public services. Um, so I think the majority of us um, go back and forth across the line between being fairly stable, being precarious, needing help. Um, and I think the important lesson from that is if we're all going to, uh, if many of us, two thirds of us are eventually going to dip into this system, like we should be building the system that we think we deserve, right? But because of the way that structural systemic racism works in the United States, um, and because of the long history we have of sort of hating and punishing poor people, um, we build these systems for these mythical 
dysfunctional, um, bad choice making, um, you know, like these bad poor people that we think exist, but that they're, they're us, right? And so we're building these systems for ourselves. Um, I have a great activist friend of mine uh, who's a, a prison abolition, does prison abolition work, um, gives a really, makes a really good metaphor for this, which she says, um, you know, I'm not saying that prisoners and prison guards have the same experience of prison because they don't, but we are building systems where everybody is in prison, right? So the warden's in prison, the guards are in prison, the prisoners are in prison. They're not having the same experience, but they're all in prison. And I think there's a similar argument to be made around the digital poorhouse, which is um, we're building this institution for this mythical um, uh, population, and and it, it's it, many of us will likely end up there ourselves. And then once we get there, we built this structure that means it's harder to escape it. Um, and so I don't love the argument from self-interest, right? Like, oh, you should care because you might eventually, like, you know, you might eventually come into contact with it. I mean, we should care even if we're never going to come into contact with it because it's it um, violates people's human rights. It creates enormous suffering um, in the United States. But if you're a person who's moved by self-interest arguments, right, there's a self-interest argument to be made here too, which is that two thirds of us will end up in the system at some point in our adult life. And so we should be paying attention to what we're building for ourselves. Yeah. All these tools that you described were a part that a lot of public money uh, <laughs> was used it through tender, public tenders and other kind of uh, processes, public processes to give private enterprise uh, the ability to build them. One of the I, one of the points you 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 correctly uh, do in your book is that the, those tools were uh, developed for this specific purpose, like punishing the poor. But now we are seeing uh, that all of us, and even more after the COVID. Uh, pandemic, the digitalization of public health, the digitalization of education, the digitalization of public administration. So we are also starting to use these kind of tools that are not exactly or not directly developed for punishing us, but they are extracting a lot of data from us uh, and they can be used for the same purposes, but with more legitimacy. So uh, I don't know if, for example, in Spain, uh, we have seen like Google and Facebook enter it, on most of the uh, uh, communities, uh, and they started like <laughs> locking us on the platforms, extracting data for from the from the kids, uh, from the students. Uh, so, uh, which is the relation here between those previous logic uh, of tools specifically developed for punishing the pure people, and now that we have more developed tools, uh, but they rely on. Private and uh, private platforms that can be sell it as a service to the public administration. So a lot of logic is going on there. So what's your your opinion here? Yeah, I think you can definitely see that kind of. I think of it as mission creep, right? Like once you have the tools, you're you you know once you have the hammer, everything starts looking like a nail, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I think this is true in. Um, policing technologies, right? You start with these security technologies and then you find them sort of moving into um, um, other communities and, uh, and, and, uh, and um, serving other purposes, um, but they carry sort of logics of punishment with them. I think the same is true of the digital poorhouse. Um, and the probably the most direct example I can think of is right before the pandemic, I wrote a piece for The Guardian about um, the government's um, state governments and the federal government in the United States attempting to um, recoup what they believed were old debts from being overpaid public services. So I looked in both Iowa and Illinois. Um, and in both of those places, in both the unemployment system and um, uh, nutrition assistance, what we, what we used to call food stamps and cash assistance, um, I talked to um, dozens of people who had gotten these letters that say things like, um, oh, oops, we overpaid you food stamps in 1985, um, right? Like you owe us $1,500. Um, prove that you don't owe us this money from 30 years ago, um, 35. 
um, or um, set up a payment plan with us to pay us back, or we'll send this debt to the federal government and the federal government will retain a portion of your tax refund or of your social security check or, or whatever. And this I actually started to look for because when the book came out, I went to Australia um, on book tour and I learned about um, robo debt in Australia, which is a very, it's like a very similar system. The Guardian's done some really good work on that. It, that system's since been overturned, but it did a really similar thing. Um, and um, this sort of like fraud prediction that we see in many of these systems, um, I think we'll see um, targeted against the millions and millions of people who um, got unemployment benefits during the pandemic, for example. I, I suspect in a few years, we'll see those very same tools used to see if anyone was accidentally overpaid in unemployment. And of course, like the state actually doesn't have much data. Um, the people who received the benefits don't have like receipts and stuff from 1985. So nobody can prove the debt actually exists, but because it's the federal government, they don't have to. They're like, we're just going to say that since the computer says the debt exists, the debt exists, and now you have to pay us or we're going to keep your social security check or a portion of your social security check. So those kinds of systems definitely um, bubble up into other um, uh, other areas. Um, so not just unemployment, but, you know, eventually I, I'm, I'm sure private systems as well. Um, and there's a lot of traffic across, across that boundary, right? So the state gets a lot of its strategies, say, from credit card companies, and then credit card companies buy data from the state. And, you know, so this stuff goes back and forth across um, these borders um, quite a lot. So yeah, I think mission creep is like very real. Um, and I think particularly in, um, in these times where we're really committed to stories about austerity, that these tools can move very quickly um, from program to program, but also from country to country. And so why, one of the reasons I bring up Australia is um, a, a new project that I'm working on now with my colleague Andrea Quijada um, is looking at, so one of the things I feel like is there's been so much conversation around algorithmic injustice in the last couple of years, a real like flowering of really great thinking and action around this stuff. Um, but one of the things I think is still missing from a lot of this work is the stories of people who are directly affected and the analysis of people who are directly affected by these systems. So my colleague Andrea and I have been working together to collect um, a number of oral histories from people who are um, experiencing the most drastic changes that come with the digital welfare state. Um, we're working on a volume with an organization called Voice of Witness. Um, currently is called Not a Number, Global Stories from the Digital Welfare State. Um, and one of the things we're doing is saying like, you know, context matters, like your political history matters, like how things work on the ground matters. But the reality is there's patterns that are global and that we need to be paying attention to. Because you can bet that Citibank and Bank of America are talking together about these things um, and that the federal government of the United States and the federal government of the UK and the federal government of Spain are talking to each other, right? Like, so we all need to be talking to each other too. We need to be able to see these patterns as they emerge. Um, and so I'm really excited about that new work. Um, and it makes me want to ask you everything about what's happening in Spain. Um, but maybe that that's a later conversation that's not for today. Yeah, well, uh, in Spain, this, uh, <laughs> these logics are, well, and well, you can you can go to the black codes uh, even to the 18th century, and you started seeing uh, imperial regimes typing down the names on specific archives. That uh, well, <laughs> it was like some, some something from two centuries ago. So uh, this is a kind of thing that started quite a while ago. We recently yeah. uh, wrote a, a a paper for surveillance and society where we developed this. The logics in Spain are different because here there's this specific geographic place where you are very near to Africa. You have Celta Melilla very near, so there are kind of um, migration flows coming into Spain. So uh, here the legitimization of surveillance or what we call surveillance primitivism it's very much uh, directed to to immigrants or to migrants. So. Uh, 
but this is also present on the police that are developing predictive, and this is a, a, a hot issue, in the, a hot topic on your book, these predictive uh, tools. For example, here the police are starting to apply them in Madrid. Uh, they are building all the software that police uh, departments uh, are using. I mean, they, they tell us that it's for doing it, then the departments more efficient, being able to digitalize and to modernize. This is the rhetoric, no? Modernize the public services, which is a kind of uh, rhetoric to end up legitimating this operation. So uh, one of the things you point out on the book is this, no? Apart from police, uh, that for me this is very important because in the end uh, it's like well we don't have a welfare system anymore we need to use technologies to punish uh poor people but also uh, came something that it's very interesting that it's the leading place uh that you point out there no how the people are starting to be discriminated uh, by this algorithm even in their house and this in the context of uh and in the work, Airbnb, Uber, using the same logic, even China, using this logic with the social credit. I mean, it's not obviously the same because it's not the same approach, uh, has a lot of other logics, economic logics for organizing their own economy. But this, in the end, is the same, uh, using punctuations, classifications, and predictive tools to organize society and uh, organize the country because the bureaucracy or the public service body cannot do that anymore. So uh, this externalization of public duties to algorithms is uh, it's a common it's a common point. Yeah. So um, one of the things I really wanted the book to do. So I made a very conscious choice in automating inequality, which is to not talk about policing. Um, and I did that for like a really specific reason, not because I don't think it's important. It's hugely important. And there are a ton of people doing work on sort of digital tools and policing, particularly things like predictive policing, which is really exciting and really important, particularly in the context of abolition movements. Um, that said, um, I think that sometimes in the United States, um, it is easier for us to see policing as a punitive system. And then for folks who have not experienced the social assistance system firsthand, they tend to see it as a supportive system. And that provides a sort of ideological cover for using these tools, right? So for example, in the ethical review of the Allegheny Family Screening Tool, that, which is a tool that basically predicts, is supposed to be able to predict which children will be victims of abuse or neglect in the future. So it is a screening tool that helps human beings decide which families should undergo a full child protective services investigation at, at the end of which they may lose their children to the foster system. So this is an incredibly consequential system, right? In the ethical review of this system, the, the professional ethicists who initially reviewed it were like, you know, like some people might find that really surveillant, but because this system is only supportive and not punitive, then it's okay. And what I did was slightly different when I looked at it, which was rather than sort of say, this is my ethical framework and like, let's start from the top, like the most abstract stuff and work down. I said, let's start from the people who actually experience this system and work up, like, which is a different ethical commitment, right? And the reality is that uh, Angel and Patrick and all of the other folks I spoke to in Allegheny County don't experience um, Child Protective Services as primarily a supportive agency. They experience it as both supportive and a police uh, and, and an arm of policing, right? They, they experience it as punitive um, and as dangerous for their families. So this idea that like, oh, what's the worst that can happen in these supportive systems, people will just get more support like if support looks like us taking your children away, then then that's uh, uh, like that's a deep problem. Um, and so I made this choice to talk just about social assistance in the United States rather than to talk directly about policing, because I wanted to make that um, complexity really clear for folks that um, social assistance historically in the United States has been at least as punitive as it has been supportive. Um, and that it is an arm of social control um, in the same way that the police are. And so I've been really happy to be in conversation with people who do more direct work around technologies of policing, um, even though that's not something I've done myself, because I think this sort of, 
um, uh, sort of, uh, Dorothy Roberts calls it sort of e-carceration, right? That this kind of e-carceration doesn't just happen in the criminal justice system. It also happens in these, in these other places, in homeless services and child protective services and um, in, in social assistance. Um, so um, I made that choice because I really wanted to talk about social control. Um, and part of the reason that I did that is because otherwise, like you said, people can just say like, oh, well, if you don't like Facebook, you know, gathering all your data, just don't use Facebook. Like if you don't like Twitter, like doing X or Y, just don't use Twitter. Like it's your choice. You're a consumer rather to use these tools or not. And I think both in policing and in social assistance, the consent, the choice there is much more complicated, right? Like, so you can say, I suppose that like, if you don't want the state to gather all this information about you, just don't apply for food assistance. But if you don't have enough food in your house, <clears throat> that's classic child neglect and CPS will take your kids. Um, so that's, I don't think by any stretch of the imagination can be imagined to be voluntary um, uh, um, giving up of information, right? Consent here is really complicated. Um, and so that's part of what I wanted to get at as well is like so much of the great work that happens around these tools is focused on social media. And that's really important, but we do at least to a degree interact with social media on a voluntary basis. And the folks I talk to don't really interact with these tools on a voluntary basis. And I think that makes the issues just much more clear uh, and makes the stakes much more clear. Like, why does this really matter? It matters because, um, you know, it's not just whether or not you use Facebook. It's like whether or not you get to keep your kids. It, that's like real impact on people's lives, like lasting, devastating impact on people's lives. And I wanted to, I wanted to honor people's actual stories, people like Kim Stipes and, 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 and her daughter, Sophie, and people like Gary Boatwright in Los Angeles and Angel and Patrick in, in Allegheny County. Um, they were so smart, they had such incredible analysis, and they were so generous sharing their stories um, because sharing their stories put them at enormous risk. And everyone who's in the book, shot, uh, except for one person, except for Janine in Pittsburgh, um, every single one of them went on the record with their real names and their real stories. Um, and that was an incredible gift. Um, right. And so I feel really responsible to make sure their stories get carried correctly and that people understand how important these shifts are in, in their day to day lives and eventually in ours as well. The, the point, this idea of uh, taking the examples, not from the private platforms, but from the public platforms, even if you use the example of IBM in different parts of the book and other private companies. I think it's quite interesting uh, because tell us uh, or explain us something that you basically develop at the end of, of the book. That is this idea that we really uh, are using our public money to build up these systems and we can design them on a very different way. And uh, at the end of the book, you, I mean, <laughs> like here, we don't want to end with this kind of uh, depressing scenario. <laughs> there are some kind of alternatives. And I think that this idea that we were really using public money to develop public platforms that are really punishing the poor when they can be doing many other things. Obviously, I would like to, to hear from you what kind of technologies uh, we can use also to have a very different relationship with uh, the bureaucratic bodies, that it's a very specific topic on uh, on. On the, on the academy because it's like how can we develop another relation uh, with the state using technologies, participating in Barcelona is also very uh, very uh, on this topic. But as the second point, not just to be very technocentric, is uh, something that you also that you also put in the book. It's this idea of building different institution. So not just co-developing or co-designing tools, but also using this as a mean or as a kind of tool uh, to think on different political institutions and different political relations that now is very tied up to uh, an individual, a citizen, to a party and this to a state. So uh, how did you imagine this alternative framework? Yeah, so this is why we love history and we love struggle, right? In the in the uh, words of one of my mentors, uh, Barbara Smith, who's this amazing black um, feminist in the United States, 
Um, so one of the lessons we can take from this history is that the, the physical poorhouse, the actual brick and mortar institution of the poorhouse was supposed to be cheaper and more effective. Um, and it was way more expensive and it didn't work at all. <laughs> and likely that's what's gonna happen with these um, digital or invisible institutions as well. Um, Cause it's based on the same incorrect assumptions. But one of the, um, and, and systems are enormously expensive, both in terms of finance, public financing and in terms of human costs. So if you look at um, the system I describe in Indiana, um, this is a system that ended up, the contract ended up being close to $1.4 billion to automate the eligibility uh, uh, for Medicaid, um, the medical insurance for poor and working families and, and um, uh, other kinds of assistance. Um, and it ended up, um, it ended up denying a million applications in the first three years of its work. Um, so it was a very expensive tool that ended up cutting people off from their benefits. Um, but one of the good lessons we can take from the history is one of the reasons that actual physical institution of the poorhouse didn't last is that um, the people who were incarcerated there like used it as a way to develop um, you know, connection to each other and to resist the system. Um, they, people used them seasonally. They would move in the winter and move back out in the spring, um, right? They, there was people in close proximity to each other. And one of the reasons we stopped using poor houses in the United States is they became places where people organized. <laughs> and that was not what the state meant. They were like, no, don't talk to each other. Like, just suffer, like stop talking to each other. But that's not how people are, right? Um, and so um, this provides us, I think, with an interesting challenge with the digital poorhouse, which is we don't have that physical proximity of people to each other in the way that we do, say, in welfare offices. And welfare offices are terrible places. And if people can avoid them, I highly recommend it. But as an organizer, I recognize that welfare offices were great places to, to, to do organizing because people were all together in the same room. They were frustrated. They were there for a long time and they were ready to talk alternatives, right? So it's a great place to organize. Um, I'm concerned that these new tools take away those abilities to have physical sort of accidental proximity to each other, which I do think can fuel movements. That said, the tools also open up other ways to come together and do political organizing. And I think we see that sort of across the spectrum um, of these tools. But I mean, the upshot uh, in terms of solutions is I think of the same thing as the solutions have always been. This might just be my theory of change, but I am a, you know, power concedes nothing without a demand girl, right? I, I believe that what leads to change is us demanding change and um, connecting well enough and building networks and solidarity well enough that we can demand change, not just for ourselves, but for our neighbors and um, other members of, uh, of our communities. Um, and so I don't think that we necessarily need like a new digital justice movement, though that's great. If that's your, if that's your scene, like go for it. Um, I feel like as someone who has been a welfare organizer in the past, that um, what we need to do is know whatever we're working on, whether we're working on prison abolition or LGBTQ rights or um, disability justice um, or economic justice, um, that we also have to pay attention to these tools now, that this is part of our work, is like understanding how these tools shape political possibility, um, resisting them entirely where that's appropriate, but also, um, you know, working within and among and through um, the way these tools work in the world. Um, and I genuinely believe that we can do that. I think one of the incredible lessons of the pandemic, though it's um, a complex one, is that there's all these things that were supposedly completely off the table, could never happen, politically impossible that all of a sudden just happened <laughs> during the pandemic, right? So like in the United States, we've never had a, like a child, a child payment, right? Like many countries have these sort of parenting support payments. Um, we've never had one until like all this, and it's always been considered, lots of people have been working for it for decades, but it's always been considered an almost impossible political task. And like it basically happened overnight. Like we'll see what happens with this 
um, small um, um, child payment that the Biden administration is talking about. Um, same is true in Australia, where they've been trying to raise their daily um, rate, the, what's called the new start rate there for 20 plus years. And overnight during the pandemic, it doubled. So it, we're seeing that the things that we've been told are impossible are in fact possible. Um, and there's a lot of struggles in the future, right? Like recognizing that um, there are still class divisions, even when everybody feels real precarious, like that's really important. Um, in the United States, addressing the um, incredible upsurge of racial justice organizing that's happening and, and um, thinking through how white supremacy has um, shaped our organizing. We have all of these challenges um, still, but I think the solution is what the solution has always been. And this goes all the way back to the, the actual poor house and before, which is that um, we only get what we need to live in a generous and fair world when we demand it. And just the last, the last very, very, very brief question. Uh, you, one of the two of the conditions that you uh, basically, uh, that are basically your thought for, for equality are political militancy uh, and, and common goods. Uh, and insisting on this question again very briefly, don't you think that uh, an approach to data, a different approach to data, like that as a common and all those, I mean, not as a specific movement like digital, but don't you think that this could be useful also to uh, uh, imagine an alternative welfare system, an alternative digital welfare system that could be also useful for giving us tools for political organization and for creating imaginaries that could be not such so dystopia, dystopic as the ones we are seeing, but with uh, another kind of uh, positive approach to, to technology. Maybe I think it's useful also. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I my tendency, particularly three year, three and a half years after publishing the book and seeing where the conversation has gone um, since the book, it's gone in some really exciting places. But I also feel like um, sometimes we put too much faith in um, training data scientists or computer engineers differently, like so that they'll, you know, care about the world or whatever. Like I do actually think most of those folks already cared about the world and there are institutional structures that keep them from doing these projects that are geared more towards justice. Um, that doesn't mean that's impossible. I just, um, again, theory of change thing here. I'm not sure the solution is gonna come from Google engineers or, or, or Twitter programmers. Um, or even computer science departments. Like, I feel like the solution is gonna come from people who have vast experience in the realities of their own lives and then can pick up the tech later. Like, I can teach, I can teach anybody what you need to know about a predictive model in about 15 minutes. Like, I mean, they're way more complicated than that, but the basics are actually not that hard. Um, and what's missing in these conversations is the impacts, not the intentions. Like we talk too much about intentions and not enough about impacts. So one of the um, sort of alternative systems that I mentioned that gives me hope um, is a system um, out of an organization in Chicago called M Relief. It's like a lowercase M like mobile relief. Um, and the thing that makes M Relief um, different, so they basically made apps that make it easier for people to get um, access to public services like, like nutrition assistance. Um, and the thing that makes them different, because they're basically, their goal is to do exactly the same things as the state asserts its goal is, which is to make it easier for people to get the benefits for which they are eligible. But what's different about them is they just have a very different value orientation. So they come out of the welfare rights movement, their like primary um, commitments are to things like dignity um, and self-determination and um, the upholding of people's basic rights. Um, and they end up producing very different systems than, than the states or, or private company, other private companies that don't have those value commitments um, do. So it's absolutely possible to create different tools, to, even to create liberatory tools. Um, but too often we think building these tools in neutral, like building them to be objective, um, is the same thing as those tools being fair. Um, and that's simply untrue, right? So building them in neutral or building them to just be objective is basically building them for the status quo. And if you're unhappy with the status quo, then that's not, that, that's not the change you want. So 
I think actually, strangely, the solution to um, the problems of bias and, um, the, and the problems of sort of austerity focus in these tools is to build more explicitly value laden technologies. Like we have to decide what are the shared values behind these tools are and build towards those values explicitly. And, and I think there's a lot of values beyond efficiency and cost savings, right? There's dignity, there's autonomy, there's self-determination, um, there's sovereignty. I really appreciated that you raised sovereignty because I've learned a lot from the indigenous, the global and the US indigenous data sovereignty um, uh, work that's happening in the world. I think that's a really interesting alternative framework as well. Um, so yeah, I think there are different frameworks that lead to different technology, but I think it starts with a conversation about values and goals explicitly. Yeah. Like that's not gonna happen. Justice doesn't happen on accident, right? You know, you know, have to it on purpose. I was just saying that maybe we can build that this kind of deep mind solution that we will have made of machine learning, not as a service, but as a right. So uh, you can predict your own illness and that should be part of the welfare state and that should be, can be done tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. but, well, this is yeah. not happening and this is a political struggle, obviously, as you are saying. Yeah. I think that we almost spent an hour talking with you. Uh, I think it's enough. Well, it's never enough, but the people... I mean, they can read the book, uh, translated by Capitan Swing, La Automatización de la, de la Desigualdad, de, de, de Virginia Obax. Uh, many thanks for, for being here uh, tonight. Uh, it was a pleasure. Um, hopefully, uh, you wow. disappear. Hopefully, we will continue the conversation and the public debate in Spain uh, with your arguments and with your, and with your position. So many thanks. I love that. Um, so thank you so much for the invitation and the, the, the great conversation. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to learn more about what's happening in Spain.